we are back with another Black Window Cream podcast. New episode every single Wednesday and Sunday. I am your host, Ben Haggerty, a.k.a. Ben Real First World. Our very special guest for episode number 59 is my dog, Mike Parento. Mike is a director, cinematographer, editor from Canada, but has been living in Los Angeles for a while. Mike works with massive brands. He just recently directed a massive budgeted commercial for Ford. He's also worked with brands like Columbia, Red Bull, Bentley, Audi, there's so many brands he's worked with, I can't even remember all of them. And his story is insane. Like for his first job, he was able to pitch a company to give him a hun- no, $1,500, and he's never filmed anything professionally before. He got $1,500 out the gate. And then he was able to take that footage, turn it into a demo reel, and then pitch the footage or the reel to another company who then gave him a fucking, I swear to God, this number is real, $50,000 budget for his second job ever. And he was just learning on the fly, shooting on like a, a small DSLR. I think at the time, a DSLR. I'm dead serious. It's the wildest story. You have to listen to this one. Mike's a good friend of mine. He's worked with me on my most recent documentary, helping me shoot that shit, edit it, whatever. Um, And his wife and him are good friends with me and Lauren. uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you, Mike. So when you're listening to this, know that, bro. And if you want to learn an amazing story and get some solid advice, this episode is for you. All right, my people. By the time you're hearing this episode, that means our new Black Window Cream official merch is available. We have the limited edition Keep Creating hoodie. Once this thing is gone, it's gone. You want to lock it down. It's mad comfortable. We have several flagship t-shirts that are going to be in the store. They're both designed by our good friends Stephanie and Scotty. I've linked to both of their, you know, their work in the description of each piece of merch, so definitely check them out. We have our flagship mug, a coffee mug, you heard, and a fucking hat. We got everything. Long sleeve tees too. Damn. Damn, Ben, you really outdid yourself on this one. I know I did. You're welcome. Thank you to anyone who supports this podcast and the private community by picking up some gear. We cannot thank you enough. And if you want to go one step farther, consider supporting us on Patreon to receive discounts each month on merch. Not only will you be able to shave off a little bit on your merch price, um, you'll also be able to help us grow the Black Window Cream brand and get access to the podcast interviews one week early and so much more. Thank you to all of you who are currently a patron. You guys are the shit. Okay, I'm done plugging this shit. The merch is available. It is shop bwnc.com or bwnc.com slash merch whichever one you want to go to i hope you guys like it we, we really do thank you guys also if you want to get the discount shit it's patreon.com slash black window cream there you go if this is your first time tuning into the podcast you're probably wondering what does black window cream stand for black window cream is a private content creator group fueled by caffeine or at least i take my coffee black window cream but you can drink or not drink whatever caffeine you fuck with and still be a part of our community we are a free private group on facebook open to creators of all kinds aka if you make videos if you're a photographer if you do marketing management editing dancing etc 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 all creators are welcome our private group has been growing rapidly we have a shit ton of members working together by sharing content they're asking for feedback they're passing tips and tricks along to one another with the goal of pushing each other to become the best motherfucking content creators on earth and you can join our group if you want to by going to bwnc.com slash join we would love to fucking have you please join all right that's it enjoy the work week keep creating make sure to tune in every wednesday and sunday for a new black window cream episode and without further ado i bring to you my interview with mike and the most epic podcast intro ever created right motherfucking now attention if you stop this podcast recording at any time you will die i don't do you want to live? Yeah! You have 24 hours to share this podcast with five people or you will die. I'm kidding. You won't die. You're just weak shit for not sharing. And the winner of the best motherfucking podcast goes to... Goes to... Black with no cream. What do you think? It's so fucking dumb and so fucking Ben Haggerty. I knew you would say that. And we are back with another Black with no cream podcast. Today, I, things are different, obviously. If you're watching this on YouTube, we're in a different environment. Mike, what would you say this? Where, where are we right now? Done by Lauren. We are in my... Getting our nails done. We are in my apartment. Lauren doesn't do nails. Well, my girlfriend does eyelash extensions and has uh, our second bedroom turned into her office. So that is why we're sitting on this nice, purple, vibrant couch with the Done by Lauren eyelashes behind us. Anyway, special guest, Mike. He's I, I pumped you up really hard. And the Facebook group, and everyone on earth knows that you are the world's biggest commercial director who has worked with the biggest brands. Dun dun dun. Mike really is, though. And when I met Mike, we've known each other for how long have you lived in LA? Year and a half. First, tell everyone what you do. (laughs) 
introduce yourself i, I i'll pre i'll preface it preface it in the intro and i'll talk about all like i'll try to summarize the jobs but just like summarize the kind of work you do and yeah, yeah. brands blah, blah, blah. you know you've heard this podcast. michael parento 27 years old um i do from docs to commercial work more specialized in cars and fashion uh to just getting into script and narrative now um pretty much have touched on it all music video all the above but i would say my niche is in the world of cars mm. and would you classify that as like extreme sports style filming so i started in the extreme sports area and that's how i we can get into that later but that's how i transitioned into cars then from cars to luxury cars luxury cars to fashion and so on and so on. Now he just shoots promo ads for Craigslist. Yeah. For if you have a car that's for sale, fifteen hundred dollars or less, he'll shoot a spot for you for forty two dollars. It's a hell of a deal. You gotta get it right now. Yeah, use the yeah, use yeah, your yeah. code. <laughs> use the BWNC code right now to save yourself forty two dollars. Um so anyway, me and Mike met a long time ago. On not a long time ago, but when I first yeah, moved when here. you first moved here. And my, Andrew Sandler, who everyone knows on the podcast, he's been in the shit since day one. He introduced me to mike for our documentary that's how we met right it was lewis's doc so we were doing me and andrew were co-directing lewis's doc andrew had just met with you um because i think your guys is agents or something management management same, yeah. yeah same management so when mike moved here from canada the manager was like oh you should link with andrew and vice versa so then you guys went and got coffee and andrew came back and he was all stoked after me and you're like dude this guy's so fucking sick he's doing all this shit with like fucking different companies red bull and all these car commercials and stuff like we got to get him in the circle and then we turned around and had lewis's doc like right after that and uh you i met you at my you were just there andrew must have told you i don't even know if you asked me you were just out of the house yeah. <laughs> to do a we little just briefing, shooting. just yeah. to shoot. And then uh, we became friends ever since then, dude. Tight. It's been good. It's um, been good. But we went, to, we went to Ohio and spent a week. Did I, live, what, did I share a room with you or was I with Andrew? With Andrew. But I didn't know Alex. you. Oh, yeah, we put you with Alex, Alexander Nikisha. And shout out to Alex, but damn, you got to share a room with Alex. He's going to fucking break your mold real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get no Alex comment. on No comment. No comment. Alex DP'd and you were... I mean, it was kind of like you were both doing it. I don't really know. How the I was just there to help. Like we just met and <clears throat> I was just coming along for the ride and right. stoked to just work with some young blood. Yep. And it ha and you had a red camera, which was helpful too, because yep. we were, Alex was also shooting on a red and then Mike just wanted to be involved. So Mike worked with us on that project and just helped us string it along. Cause that shit takes months doing docs. So we got like a, we work office together. We've had, we've done a lot of shit together. Yeah. Cool. It's been a good year. Yeah. It's a good year. But now motherfuckers moving back to Canada. Cause the boy did you announce this yet? Publicly? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He's having a baby. <sighs> Little baby boy. He's stoked. Trying not to think about it right now. Yeah? Yeah. Cause you're nervous? I just He kept saying like it's gotta be a boy. The baby's gonna bankrupt me. No. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Maybe he's going to be dope as fuck. <laughs> Mike used to ride unicycles, guys. He used to ride unicycles, and he probably doesn't want this to be out here on the podcast. No. He can do backflips on unicycles. No. Front flips? Yeah, but no. Yeah, not anymore. yeah. Back in the day, the boy used to have some skills, but that could be your kid's path. I will fight to my death, so that's not. So he's not an extreme unicycler? No, he's going to be a golfer, baseball player. I don't know, something that makes, makes a lot of money. Makes a shit ton of money? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, okay, so let's step it back. What, uh, how did this all start in Canada? Cause you used to, I know they used to ski or, um, I used to race mountain bikes. Race mountain bikes. Yeah. So basically how I started was I was, um, uh, in like the junior world cup circuit racing mountain bikes, got injured, started helping my, the no, guy no, who's no, filming me. You're going me. so fast. What the fuck is junior world circuit? Okay. That so I was racing downhill mountain bikes. Right. In and like the that's junior a league? world cup is that a league well the it's like a type world of mountain biking and then the junior world cup is a league like there's the world cup and then the world cup for juniors which is just what what 18 and under yeah yeah i think it's 18 17 or 18 so then how long have you been riding bikes for a long time like my whole life since i could walk i like started riding bikes how, how, how do you so how do you get into that league you race 
you just start racing locally, then provincially, oh. then nationally, then... Do you have to be sponsored to get... I was. I was, like, grassroots sponsorships. Like, you just get free stuff. You weren't getting paid, but um, it helps. You don't have to be, but right. it helps. Okay. So, then you're in the Junior World Cup. So, then I blew out my knee racing. During, in the World Cup? Not training for it. Oh, shit. And, um, but I wasn't good. Like, I wasn't going to make money. <laughs> I was like, I was keen then, but now looking back at it, it's the best thing that ever happened because I would have just kept going and I was like, okay enough to be in the same room as these people, but I wasn't good. I was right. never going to win. Right. And so, and especially those kind of sports, like most action sports, you're either the top 10 and you're making big bucks or you're, you know, living off craft dinner and you're just trying to keep going and, right. until you make it there. But I just, I didn't really like the community of the sport. I didn't. It was just like, yeah, it was short lived. So, you know, fate took its path and I was out and, um, the guy who was filming me while I was supposed to recover, my doctor's like, you know, at one point he was like, you should be like hiking and stuff and like building the strength of your knee back up and right. a brace and stuff. And he was just like, um, you know, just whatever you can do to make it stronger. So the guy who's filming me, I was like, yo, do you need someone to run a camera or like can i carry your stuff i just need to hike the trails and blah 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 he's like yeah man i got a spare camera like shoot b cam so i took it and i was shooting b cam and i was like man this is way more fun than riding like i don't have to almost kill myself i get to just like screw around and take cool shots right. and tell the guy what the mountain biker what to do i was like i'm never going back like this is my thing so i bought a camera so was the guy that was filming you why was he filming you? Was he like part of the team or something like your team that you were writing he for? Just, he's just passionate local just filmmaker local that right. was like just making videos. Yeah. yeah. We paid him a little bit here and there, I think, but he not, just like, wanted to be it's, involved. Yeah. It's nothing. Right. Damn. So you bought your first camera. So then I bought my first camera at GH one and I hacked it. So to I don't what? know what that means. It like shot higher bit rate or something. Oh, cool. But, um, Tight. yeah. And then, I hit the ground running. I was like, you're how I was old were you? Six, 17. Okay. So I got my camera and I, uh, I like, I thought I was going to take over. Like you I did. You uh, I wanted do. to. You eventually do. But, but so I just had this mentality. I was like, I'm going after like all my sponsors. I'm going after everyone else's sponsors. I'm going to make videos and get paid. My first job was for monster energy. What the fuck? And so I've got, actually got a good story how I started. It really, I've you'll get it knowing more about my personal life, yeah. how I approach things. But so I get this job because I knew a rider that was sponsored by Monster, and I pitched them like, "Hey, I got this cool idea. We want to shoot this. I need fifteen hundred bucks, or I can't remember, <laughs> or something small like yeah. that." And they're like, "Yeah," and I'm like, "Really? Sick. Okay, <laughs> next time I'm going for ten grand, yeah. right?" But so, anyways, we do the shoot, and it's sweet, and. It was just a local shoot. and for, so, then, so you involved the rider that was sponsored by Monster? Yeah. So you're just like, yo, I'll shoot him for $1,500 for this idea. Yeah, he was yeah. a homie of mine and it was right. just easy. And then, so it went really well. And I actually had like a decent eye that because I knew angles for mountain biking. Well, and yeah, so you're I like shooting for biking. yourself. Like yeah. stuff that you would want for you probably. So then I had this video and like I'd shot some other like little passion projects and stuff and I made a demo reel and I was like, I'm going after the big, like the big bucks, right? <laughs> so I started hitting up every company I could. I was call, cold calling, like left, right, center. Just every day I'd call like maybe 20 companies a day. I found this website called like Data Connect or something where you could put people's names in or like brands and they give you the phone numbers for like what the whatever fuck? person you want, head of marketing or whatever. So I was like, bing, bang, boom, like hitting all these companies. <laughs> I got a contract for $50,000 from a shoe company. <laughs> this is my second job I've ever had in my Jesus life. Jesus Christ. And you just have your one camera? By then, no, I think I still only had my GH1. But I bought some, like, I bought a crane, like a Kessler crane and right. things like that. So anyways, I get this job. Uh, they fly me, it's my first time to California. They fly me to California to meet with them. I... I pitched myself then, like, I made it sound like I was this big, hot shot, like, yeah, but Monster Energy, blah, 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 like, you know, yeah. like, go big or go home kind of thing. Never thought I'd get a budget like that at that point. They gave me, the, I met with them here in California. 
we did all the creative and I'm like faking it till I'm making it yeah, big time. Pitching. They're like, they're like, so we're talking storyboards and I'm like, oh yeah, we'll do storyboards. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is a storyboard? Googling it on my laptop. I'm like, Man, uh, you know, whatever. So I draw the storyboards myself. They're like stick figures. I didn't know you had to do like a professional. I was like, I just suck at drawing this. It's like how it goes. Uh, so I'm drawing this, blah, blah. Anyways, for those there, of you who don't know what storyboarding is, it's just you lay, you're it's a trying sketch. to it's an, like comic sketch, animating almost. what your idea is on paper so people could see almost frame by frame or scene by scene what it should look like. Yeah. Okay. And so, like on bigger jobs, you learn that I learned later. It's a very important step of the process. Here, I was like, Especially I just draw stuff, and I didn't even care if it ended up close to that, right? Right. So, we're all ready to shoot. I've got the athletes that they gave me all lined up, blah, blah, blah. What, what was it for? What it was a, what kind of athletes? Um, it was a shoe company. So, we had runners. Um, we had a surfer. We had... Like professional uh, athletes? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> Damn. All right. well, I pitched myself as like, I'm an experienced yeah, horse. I'm the dude, guy. Like, I can do this. Yeah. So I get a check for, I think it was like three quarters of the amount. Cause I had to cover the production. Right. So like, you know, almost $40,000 put that in my bank account. I'm like, I'm still like 17 or maybe 18. And like, I'm rich. <laughs> I went and I blew all of it. Fuck. I just like, you know, I got a car and I got this <laughs> and that. I moved out. Blah, blah, blah. I moved out of my house. I moved shit. out of my parents' house. Oh, yeah. I was like, I'm rich. That's the most money I've ever had in my life. And so when it came to actually having to do the shoot, I had no money left. And I had to do it all on zero budget. And it was, um, I actually, I had to get my parents to help fly me to some of the locations and then I would pay them back with the remaining amount. Oh my God. But like it, we shoestrung it, like no permits, nothing, nothing, nothing. But I didn't even know that stuff was a yeah, thing. A thing. And it's hilarious looking back at it now. Cause I think of like what brand would give someone that amount of money and not double check if they had permits, but like usually there's an in-house producer right. that overlooks everything. No, no, I was free range yeah. going for it. They loved that shit. It all ended up fine. <laughs> I was like a bit over budget and I lost a little bit of money on it because, but it didn't really turn out that way. Cause I spent it yeah, all. You spent most of it anyway, but huge lesson learned. But then after that, I was like a wolf that tastes blood. I was like, I need to kill again. And it's going to be bigger. <laughs> 40K in my it's, bank account felt real it's gonna good. It's going to get way bigger. Yeah. Like to get a brand like that and then take it and do it. Even though I approached it poorly, I was like, I'm going to do it right. And now I know how much money I can actually make. Right. And so I went for it and like the rest is history. Jesus Christ. So. So that was like the start. That was like me and i didn't even know like i who wouldn't even call with? myself a director yeah i was like who was your team at no, the time it was just me it was just you oh yeah i'm from a town of ten thousand people in nelson bc check it out nelson bc um ten thousand people action sport community a lot of production companies there but i was at that point i was solo like i was like ready to i didn't need a team right i edited i shot i wasn't good at editing but i was learning yeah um, I shot everything. I had my own gear. If I needed gear, I never even thought of renting it. I just bought it. And so, but I had like a super small kit. I didn't even use lights. I still barely use lights. Right. Fuck lights. The big <laughs> ring lights. <laughs> yeah, but these lights suck. I really want to light this. Like when we get the new space, I really want to like properly light have, like, the, the space. Yeah. It's some fucking real lights. The and disco shit. ball. Comes yeah. In. Alexa. Um, so... So, okay. So then that happens. You go on to do mine. For, let's talk about where you're from actually. So in Canada, I've seen photos and I'm jealous cause I want to go there really bad. But Mike shows me pictures of his hometown, which is like this fucking beautiful mountain town area looking thing. Right. It's like a mountain town. Oh yeah. It's Have like you been to Colorado? Little... Yeah. Have you been to like Breck and shit? Have you ever been mm -hmm. to Breckenridge or like any of the ski towns up in, up in the mountains? Okay, well, that's what I imagined it to look like. And you show me pictures, and it's just like back bowls, basically, and fucking looks ridiculous. Yeah, it's take a good spot. Snowmobiles and just go out there and shred and like neck deep pow, and <laughs> it shit looks so tight. What? I guess yeah. So it was just you versus like local competitors. But then after this job, did you start? But it wasn't even that. Like I never not saw competitors, but like 
production companies were there, but you never worked with them. Did you work with they them? They were inspiring. And that's something I also want to touch on, like how I've kind of come full circle in my career. Yeah. But like they were inspiring to watch what they're doing, but they're making ski movies and bike movies. And <clears throat> that wasn't really my goal. Like right. I was like, I want to, I want to do big commercials. Like I saw that from the get go and quickly that turned into, I want to make feature films mm. like very quickly. Right. So then what do you do from moving forward past that job? What's one of the, like the next jobs you did? Cause you have so to learn. And then, I love your story too. Cause what we were just talking about is hilarious. And let me take it there. Cause I think there's a thing about being responsible instantly. Think about giving a kid. Okay. Well, hold on. We'll get to that. Sorry. Okay. Cause that's going to be part of the evolution. Got it. So anyways, so what I do next is after that <laughs> job, I was like, um, I was like, I want to do like, um, I want to travel. I right. want to see the world. And so I was like, who can I approach that will let me see the world? So I just started hitting up a bunch of companies and I hit up some random person that I didn't even really know. I can't remember how it came up, but I came across this email address and I hit them up and I was like, Hey, yo, uh, like, this is what I do. This is my demo reel, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm a big shot, blah, right. blah, blah. Like totally yeah. blowing hot air on my ass, mm -hmm. left, right, and center. And, and it ended up being like a pretty high up dude at Red Bull Media House in Austria at the headquarters. <laughs> and I got an email response back saying, Hey, can you come to Europe for the summer? And I, I was just like, just Google the guy. His name was Marcus Stolko. We're homies now. We've been homies for a while. But um, I look him up and I'm like, oh man, this guy's like one of the first Red Bull athletes. Like he's up there. Yeah. And I was like, hell yeah. Like right. I'm coming. He's like, okay, in two weeks for the whole summer. And so I like go to my mom. I was like, mom, can I please go to Europe for the summer? And well, so who's it for? Red Bull. Red what? Like, you know. Red Bull wasn't that, that big then? Well, my mom was oh, like. Oh, to your mom, right. You know. So anyways, I I go, I flew, I talked to this guy like twice on the phone. He said he was going to pick me up from the airport. They paid for my flights, everything. I stayed there for the summer. And but what I was it? Was it like a job job? I like, didn't know. I so no they didn't idea. offer you any money or anything? They were just like, come here. They just said, come here. So I assumed it was a job. But I get there. Have you, have you and seen I the didn't movie care. Taken, bro? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I get there, and I'm just shocked my parents even let me right, go. Right? What but, the fuck? Um, I get there, and I'm like, I go right away. He takes me to the headquarters, the Red Bull headquarters. Like you, I literally took. Is that their main? Is that where they're found in Austria in Austria? Salzburg? Okay. And so I'm like, this is it. Yeah, I've made it. Hell like, yeah. I'm set. But, um, so then they offered me a job to make a film and I was like, hell yeah, they're like a bike film. And I'm like, okay, on the world cup, mountain bike world cup. That's fucking like, funny. Sick. So I'm into it. This is like my jam. Yeah. I was about to do this shit. And so I traveled for three months with the team and shot them, but didn't get paid. Hmm. And they let me know right away as a freebie job. So I had to like call my parents like, yo, I'm actually not making yeah. money. Like I need help. Did they put you up or what? Yeah. Yeah. They paid for everything. I didn't have to drop a dime. Okay. So, so it was, it was uh, makes it a little bit better. But so I ended up and then, so I did the three months. I shot a bunch. Everyone was super stoked. I did like weekly little edits to like to post on yeah. social media and stuff. And this film turned into a two year project. Jesus Christ. And and so I, then I went back and I traveled with them for about two years doing this and like a few other sports in between when they needed me. Right. So the second year I started getting paid, mm. but again, not much, like right. not enough to like live off of, but right. I wasn't spending any money. So everything I made was going in my pocket. Yeah. And, um, so then the third year they're like, Hey, like, what do you think about trying a different sport? And I'm like, I've always wanted to surf can I shoot surfing? And I like hot climates. And they're like, yeah, like we can throw you on a few surf shoots. And, um, so I do one surf shoot with a, a, a big wave surfer and I'm on the beach and I'm shooting on the big zoom lens. Yeah. And I remember, I think that was the first time I used a red and like, I literally, they asked me, Hey, have you ever used like red cameras before? I'm like, Oh yeah, I've seen them before. I yeah, like, <laughs> so, you know, how hard can it be yeah. for my GH one? Right. right? It's like kind of bullshitted that I did. 
And um, luckily, the guy who gave me the camera and set it up, like, gave me a pretty good crash course because he could tell I just had no idea what I was yeah. talking about. Like, oh, yeah, the, yeah, the settings, uh, shutter speed. No, bro, I got that stuff. Like, not knowing about what fuck it is this at up. all. Yeah. Um, but he was super cool. Held my hand through it. And, um, yeah, so I just started shooting from the beach. Shooting, like, big waves, like Jaws and, like, seeing crazy stuff. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. That, so that's how you shoot that type of shit it's not like you don't go out I've seen the stuff where they're like out there in the waves and they're trying to film them with the fucking okay, so you can go on the jet ski but I was not I was like that's how you do it go on the jet ski yeah so you can go to the jet ski and there's guys that go in the water so anyways I'm shooting from the beach I'm part of this team and I see these guys going in with their housings oh. with the reds in the water and I'm like so they did have that on your shoot yeah. that's tight and I'm like that's sick I, like I want to do that shit right. and so when in between shoots, I was like, Hey man, can I like just go shoot turtles in the water? <laughs> and the guy's like, sure. You're like, so I, I like turtles. So I took the housing. And I was like shooting turtles. It's still, Hey, if you check out my demo reel, that's what that's from. Is that turtle shot? So I was on the red. Yeah. Damn. That looks so, like, when was this? Years ago. Yeah. I was just going to say that shit looks sh- fucking fire anyway. though. But anyway, so I, sh- you know, I shoot that stuff and I'm like, I love this. And I then, love turtles. So, <laughs> Um, I love oh, turtles. So th- by then, um, okay, so I was super inspired. I loved shooting in water, and that's what I wanted to do. I was right. like, I want to learn how to shoot underwater. And I knew those guys got paid a lot more money than I was getting paid on the beach. And so... And they were all shooting for Red Bull. Yep. Got and it. then, um, so basically, long story short, like I shoot more for Red Bull and stuff, and I ended up getting my own Red. And so I invested in my own Red, and I got a housing for my Red. Mm-hmm. And I'm like yo, I'm going to learn how to do this. And I remember that's when I met my wife and we were like, we were dating and I was like, hey, yo, let's, uh, do you want to go to Hawaii for your birthday? And she's like, yeah, that'd be great. I'm like, sick. That'd be great. So I bring all my stuff and like ended up being like some of the biggest fights we've ever had because I was just in the water shooting turtles oh and my God. waves and random surfers the entire birthday trip. Oh, right? shit. And she's just alone on the beach just pissed off but <laughs> i was loving it yeah, i was like I i'm getting so much practice in learning how to pull focus underwater and blah 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 yeah. and using my own housing my own camera and then i came home and sold all the footage stock footage sites and i was like this is, i paid that trip off this is the best trip ever from the stock footage sites yeah so sick oh it's so good god damn nimia is that is that the site that's my, my Ni- how do you spell it and i am i a so the way they work is you give them footage that you have an account, you upload your footage and then if anyone buys it, you're getting a percentage. Yeah. Or do they so buy like, the footage from you? No, it's so I have an account and I upload whatever I can sell and allowed mm-hmm. to sell. And then they promote you and like at least in any other, they're, they're big now, but then they were kind of just starting. They were like really pushing all their people and they still push you pretty well. And then they, um, they yeah they sell your footage and you get a cut and it's like a good cut really yeah that's dope like you know i've made above and beyond a thousand dollars for 10 seconds yeah that's sick first footage that i just shot for fun i fuck i really fucked up on that whole wave because when i had my drone when i was start, first got out here if you have flying, a drone it's like layup i was like, getting just go so fly. much footage and i would and i had a girl hit me up that she worked for one of those companies she's like yo we could do this and I'm like, yeah, how much would that go for? Because I'm kind of trying to keep it for my reel. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of want it for my shit, which I never used. And then she told me that she sold, they just bought a fucking clip of a cat for like two grand. And it was like yeah, six totally or seven depends seconds. depends the scale. She's like, who's we'll, buying? What she's they like, want it for? We'll spend money. Like, we're spending money. Like, a seven second clap, oh, yeah. clip of a, a cat. A MasterCard commercial or Visa commercial comes in and they need a stock footage. They have to spend a lot of money because they need to own the, the footage. The license of it. Yeah. It's fucking to crazy. put it wherever they want. Hmm. but yeah so anyways so i got really gone to in water and then i just started shooting a bunch of in water stuff and then with red bull as well a bit but that's kind of when i was fading out from them yeah just because i feel like i kind of not that i hit my peak with them because they do amazing stuff and right. like they're always creating crazy stuff but um i was just like i was ready to move on and like i wanted to run my own business i've always like loved hunting brands so i always wanted to like do my own thing but at the time you were working for red bull as like a, a pseudo i wasn't employee. exclusive or anything was an employer, but i was just like on their beck and call whenever yeah. they needed it right 
and still only of Europe. I've worked a, a few times with other guys in the States, like more recently, but this was all out of Austria. Yeah. So I was like, if for three years I saw, like I touched every continent, I've been to so many countries. Like I'm so fortunate. I've yeah. seen the world. That's crazy. And, um, all and getting paid mostly for it. Like that's pretty special. Yeah, that's fucking dope. So anyway, so I started fading out of that and then I got picked up um to do a universal film on the evolution of the, action sports a yeah, documentary. The doc, right? And so I did that with another homie and that was a two year project. How'd you get found for this? Were you seeking this out or did this just land in your lap? It landed in my lap. Right. And um Is the dude that also did the doc because it's you and some other guy, right? Yeah. Was he Canadian or something? Yeah. Oh, okay. He was Canadian. He's, he lives in Vancouver. Right. But um, we didn't know each other before. We okay. met when this came up. Right. But they, I guess I got brought on just because of, at that point now, I've worked with a lot of athletes in a lot of different sports, winter, summer, yeah, you've done kinda, you name it. And so I had a lot of relationships, but I also knew like what you needed. Like by then I'd learned a lot from being at Red Bull. Mm -hmm. I've gone to like, I went to, extreme sports school basically you could right. call it yeah so i guess i would thought was chosen to be the right pick for that film it took so what was the to make. What, what was the role that you you played on that then like how did That's, you know you said you're the right pick like how did they what were they trying to fulfill um originally they're looking for a dp mm -hmm. so i came on as a dp but then i became like co-direct and then i edited and scored a bit of the soundtrack yeah, and you did er like so much shit. Like it's the two of us did the whole thing yeah, basically. That's insane. We brought in a few other people here and there, but basically the two of us for two years in his basement and flying all over the world pounded that thing out. And I was still like super young at yeah. this point. Fuck. So I again I learned everything during that project. Like that two years was like YouTube and work. Like I'd be doing something, we'd hit a wall, I'd YouTube it, figure it out, do it. Right. And like it was crazy. Like for the first quarter of the film I was shooting in the wrong camera settings. <laughs> Jesus. And I'd figure that out and it was like a nightmare in post, but like Yeah, you're you just, just like, I was just like it's been my whole life journey though. I've just learnt the trial and error. Trial and error. Mm -hmm. YouTube, trial and error not much like i never went to school right like i graduated high school but that's it and i this was my schooling so then what are some of the lessons you're learning like because as you are growing up like you're dealing with more and more budgets how you how like with that guy you because you i think what you had told me what was interesting is like you guys would buy the gear that you needed or you would try to buy certain gears so that you ended up owning it utilizing the film as a way to do that but mm -hmm. it also saved you money in the long run you know what I mean? yeah like, because it was such a big project and it was a really high budget doc for docs these days yeah because it takes a lot of money to go shoot all those action sports yeah like a shit ton of money huh but we did everything like so gorilla and put money in other places and you know i we made a decent amount of money too off of it right and um who it, was it for was that that wasn't it for was Universal and E One? Oh, Universal. Who's E One? E One Entertainment. Okay. They're a studio, like a distributor, like uh, Universal. Got it. But yeah, it's big. It's a, like worldwide theatrical. Like this was my shot. Right. And it won a lot of awards. Like, yeah. It, yeah. It uh, best produced, best cinematography. Like it, it did really well. Good work, man. Yeah, I was stoked. It was like, it was, it was a good stepping stone for me and it gave me a lot of confidence. Right. And docs are tough too. From there, I I had momentum. So, but you shot all that doc on Reds? Fuck. Yeah. And probably GoPros and a bunch of other shit. Huh? Oh yeah, we had every camera. And yeah. then I kept my Red package. Right. I think up by then, no, I think I still had the first Red Epic, but... um. Yeah, I just I always shot on my red, and then we have sometimes we'd have to bring in so many cameramen on certain shoots just because you to can't shoot it, it alone, right, right? Right. So we ended up having like Sony's, Canons, and then that was a huge learning experience. Was editing like with every media type of media under the mm -hmm. sun, and you're just like, oh my god, everything's at different frame rates, blah 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 blah. And then at the end, there's a thing called QC, which I had no idea. I didn't know what it was either until we did Chris's doc. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, oh my goodness, I did 
all of this wrong. So yep. that's also why it's probably a two year project, but <laughs> right. So where can people watch that now? Is it's that on, on iTunes, iTunes or something? Yeah. It's called the search for freedom. It's old now, but it's, it's got a good message. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, you know, you'll see when you watch it, like, Oh yeah, this guy went through a learning curve when he made this. <laughs> the search for freedom starring Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> No, it's got every big name. Yeah, I was going to say, athlete. what were some of the athletes that were... Did, was there we any had, of them that you looked up to that you were like surprised to work with? Oh, yeah. We had Tony Hawk to so Kelly Slater to like everyone. Like Damn. We partnered with some of the biggest brands in the world that gave us access to some... And we had to... Some of these athletes, we had to pay to interview and whatnot, but... Um, a lot of them were pro bono and just like passionate about the concept right. of the project. But yeah, like the, the cast list is crazy. Like so, every day so I was shooting people. that film, I'm like, I can't believe I'm in your presence right now. Like right. you're my idol. Yeah. Like, you know, I got to go into the water with a lot of crazy people that was fucking and dope. shoot mountain biking, wing suiting. Like we covered rock climbing. We did, we did everything. Damn. So what do you do after that? You finish a doc. You were also probably doing jobs in the in, in between time or no? Nope. That took up a hundred percent full time on that doc, which God was damn. the coolest experience ever to do. Yeah. Like you're making good enough money to live and that's your only focus. It's that's like fucking this incredible. Film. You put everything into it. That'd be sick. It was amazing. Fuck. I feel so, like we, yeah. That's like a challenging thing to do. Cause even when we were doing Chris's doc, Lewis's doc, Mary's doc, it was always like, it's hard with today's budgets yeah. because they're they're getting tighter and tighter and you it's just like you gotta either do a tighter crew right. more gorilla and use more of the money to for the production or whatever or you do have a team but you gotta you know split it up was your guys' budget at that time like high six figures and then you it was between you two but gear plus travel like everything you had to cover travel and athletes were you paying for that out of your budget as well yep or, everything or, okay i didn't know if the house paid for it too or not no it was um like yeah universal gave us a pretty hefty chunk of money and it uh yeah we had a lot of expenses like we traveled all over the world yeah. for that film yeah that shit adds up jesus we had to always go meet the athletes where they were at that mm -hmm. time because their schedules are so busy right so then what happens after that you finish that film Film so I comes finished out. that film with that with John and um we filmed premiered in Newport. California. And, yeah. That's and fun. it was a film festival. And, oh. And I had bounced around for film festivals a while, but by then I was gone. Like I I was already onto my next right. big fish to fry. Right. So um I actually got approached by IMAX. After okay. I got a phone call one day when I was driving from this English woman who became my mentor. Um, <laughs> but she called me and she's like, I am the head of the film fund at IMAX. We'd love to have you come in and chat with us. Oh, shit. And I'm like, okay. Flight to LA. They put me up in a hotel and I was in the IMAX headquarters, which is uh, yeah. on the west side there. And and I was like, fuck. Sick. Like, right. And so they put me on a project right away. Because they're you're looking for young directors. To direct. To direct. Budget was like a few million. Like, it's crazy. And like, I had this big producer um, who just produced The Star is Born, like Bill Gerber. Who, God damn. We were like, we were crushing. And this was on Iron Man, um, the triathlon. The, the like, thing you were shooting was about Iron Man. Iron Man. So what, you were shooting it in I is IMAX specific cameras? Yeah. So they're the like, IMAX camera, right? Yeah. So now when this happened, they're just mainly film cameras. Now they're using digital as well. Right. But it's like, it was 70 millimeter film, um, huge, heavy cameras. So we had this concept where the whole film was going to be shot in Hawaii. So they flew me to Hawaii and we did a test shoot. With so their cameras? No, with just normal cameras, right. just like development. Right. Right. So, we flew to Hawaii at a team, line producers, everything. And we're just like scouting and test shooting. And we went in helis and shot with like cineflexes just to get like see angles. And I'm just like the whole time, just like, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> this is a test shoot. This is the like craziest shit I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Right? Like they're playing with money. It's amazing. But like you have to, when you have such big cameras, yeah. and the rigs are bigger, like everything costs 10 times more. You and then know. not only that, packaging the film mm -hmm. and putting it in theaters, 
costs crazy amounts of money. Right, right, right. But yeah, so they were like grooming me and I'm just like loving it and eating it up. We had this Chinese company funding the film, like everything was looking so dialed. And then, um, and then you dropped the camera out of the helicopter. I dropped the kit. No, <laughs> um, the company. So, you know, the company legendary. Yeah. Everyone knows the company. So legendary. Wanda is the Chinese company that bought legendary. Okay. They were funding our film and that was happening right while they bought it. So they bought Legendary and took the money from our film. Oh, Legendary was filming, funding your film. Yeah, so they pulled the carpet from underneath us like right before we were start sh- supposed to start <sighs> shooting. So I was like, no, like this is going to be the craziest experience ever. Um, but still, I became really close with the CEO at IMAX. Like I'm homies with everyone there. It's like everyone's super lovely, being really nice to me. And so we've been developing together since. And um the woman who initially called me was the head of the film fund. She's like a super, super close friend of mine. Like again, still a mentor. Yeah. And we talk all the time and you know, I will, it's uh, to create an IMAX film. It's a huge project. Like super huge. A lot of development. It takes years to get one off the ground. Right. So like this year's my year. I can't talk about it much, but it's, it's going to happen. Tight. Like I'm going to be on the big, big screen where my work will be but that's fucking crazy but yeah so that was my next journey um and then in the midst of all of this i started doing my first car commercials right like as you're transitioning from almost doing the film to so after this film yeah. imax hit me up but obviously that wasn't like a full-time thing that was like sprinkled throughout my calendar yeah yeah um but i was like ready for i was like hey i've done universal pictures now i'm ready for big commercials or big paychecks or whatever. Like right. I'm hungry, yeah. like really hungry now. And now I've got a lot of expenses because like we were talking earlier, I was, you know, I was making quite a decent amount of money from this film. Yep. And so I was spending a decent amount of money. Like I've always been really bad with that. Like I, I'm he's, not a saver. Okay? He's learning now saver. guys. He's learning now. He yeah. is, what did you say earlier? You, um, I learned just in time for the kid. You just learned in time for the kid. Yeah, you gotta you gotta go through it to learn it. And I said, well, I, well, I guess I never got thrown that much money when I was a fucking twenty year old kid. No, but you're definitely old. wiser than I am. Like no, but that comes. With, my dad made me take back. I remember my, my mom was gonna listen to this. She listens to every podcast episode. We were. I wanted paintball guns. So it was when I turned fifteen or I was fifteen years old. It was either I was gonna spend my money on dirt biking and buy a dirt bike, or buy my paintball gun. Cause I would ride dirt bikes all the time. My friend had them. So we'd ride every weekend. And then when I moved, I really wanted my own. And then my dad's like, you're going to need a car for that. Blah, 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 all this stuff. You need a truck. You should get a paintball gun. So eventually somehow he talked me out of getting the dirt bike. You can just ride theirs. And I was going to go pro motocross too, by the way. That was pretty good. I believe it. I was fucking. You're good at everything you touch. <laughs> I've seen your Instagram of you snowboarding in Dubai. Like, yeah, I know you, you got extreme sports Dubai, on feel me? Uh, so I get the paintball gun. Me and my mom, I, I do all my research. I'm obsessed. I look into it. I know exactly what I want. I want the Tipman 98 Custom. <laughs> I know exactly what it's called. But this is the OG. Anyone that knows a fucking paintball, Tipman's like the GOAT fucking okay. starter gun, right? Okay. And I go out, buy that shit, come back, stoked as fuck. My dad finds out I spent $200 or something, 250 bucks for a paintball gun? Yeah. That's what he says. Dang. No, we're, I've seen cheaper ones out there. We're taking it back. We're going to Walmart. Son. I have this huge fight. I have this huge fight. It makes me take it back. We get the fucking spider or whatever the fuck the paintball gun was, and it's trash, and I'm <laughs> upset as fuck. And eventually later, I, like, I end up buying it, my, the Tipman again. Like I buy it because <laughs> I'm like, I don't want this thing socks. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's always been that dude that... So he taught me how to keep my money in a smart place. You, on the other hand, did not fucking went hammer. Yeah. <laughs> this dude is out here buying every, he got, what'd you say? You're like one at like one point. I in don't time. want this to be public knowledge. It's embarrassing, but <laughs> it's I, not embarrassing. This I is true. A, this is what a I, vehicle addiction. He I was, was buying, he loved cars. I loved trucks and, I think that makes sense though. Motorbikes. Yeah, he's got motorcycles. He's got a crotch rocket sitting at his house. It, do you ever? Did you ride it? Yeah, yeah, I've ridden. Oh, that. you did ride. Yeah, I dropped it. What do you mean? Like, like you've dropped, uh, tipped it over. Heavy. You tipped it over. Yeah. To fuck it up. No, nah, it's just a little bit of paint. <laughs> but it looks like I ride it now. Right, right. It looks cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do stoppies and shit. No, no, like, I sound like a privileged dick. No, you don't. You got money. Like, do no, you? I, well. 
No, I spent the money. I right. You well, you got money. you have to get the money to spend the money. I know, but I I should have spent it on things that actually further my career even more. I thought totally. I had it made. No. Like I was thinking they're like, "Oh, I'm going to coast like this for the rest of my life. I lived like I lived a salary job right. when I was a freelancer, and that's like the biggest mistake I ever made. I didn't understand freelance. I just thought, "Oh, you know, I got like 10, 20 K a month me. coming in from jobs. It's never going to leave. Right. And then January comes around, which everyone loves January. Mm -hmm. And you're like, Whoa, I didn't uh, get a job for January, February, March, April. Oh. <laughs> like, oh, but I have like three lease payments on cars and a house a and, blah, 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 blah. and like, you know, Oh my God. And so I, I hit the ground hard. Yeah. But that was a bit later in my life. I hit the ground hard. Oh, so this is, I hit later. rock bottom. Right before I moved to LA, actually. Really? That was a huge reason why I moved. Okay, so run it back. All right, so let's step back. Okay, let's step but back. But I think that is a wise thing to talk about, which you say you're embarrassed, but like even I always find it so intriguing because like mon money can come out of nowhere. And if people aren't prepared to how to deal with it, it can really fuck you up if you don't deal with it the right way. Or you can re like utilize that income as a budget for your next project or something, you know? Well, like, and that's what I want to talk about later. Yeah. So I want to tell my full mm -hmm. circle, like my growth and yeah. then it will make sense my message after <laughs> <laughs> all right cool okay. first of all can we point out that this uh, lauren i'm so sorry this couch is so uncomfortable it's not good it's not the wave right i need two but it's a foam it's um it's it turns into a bed so they're not, obviously not gonna be that comfortable i don't think it does yeah it turns into a bed she told me oh yeah yeah, it's, this is terrible for a for podcasting. I can't sit still. I'm fucking out of control. I think that maybe the wave would be to have two chairs so we can kind of angle towards like each other. Like between two ferns, that show? Yeah, but just more comfy. You know what I mean? Um, sorry, Lauren. Your studio, the, what, what happens for her business is right over there. This is just where people can wait. So it's fine for waiting for a hot second, but I can't sit here and podcast over it all on this purple couch. <sighs> Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash black window cream so we can get a nice couch. Thank you. There you go. Um, all right. Continue. Okay. Please so continue. I finished that universal project and I came out of it and I was like, I just learned so much. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like I'm ready for the next step. Like I can start like producing stuff on my own because I co-produced that project. So I was doing a lot of logistical stuff as well as creative, mm -hmm. which is very key. And I was like, and I still didn't quite understand like the point of a team there. Like, so if you listen to like Andrew Sandler's podcast, like, you know, he's, he learned from the beginning of like what a team means to make a big production happen. I never had that. Mm. So I didn't get it. I didn't see that. Right. So I still thought like one man ban, but I know how, I know what it takes even more now to make stuff happen. Like, except for having the extra cameraman and stuff. I'm talking about like <coughs> to get a permit. Cause even for that extreme sports film, we didn't get many permits. You don't need to when you're shooting in the ocean at right. the time. Like a lot of the locations we were at, you can't get a permit for because there's no, it's like in the middle of the woods yeah, yeah. or whatever. So, so I came out of that. It's like super fortunate. I was like, I feel like I just went to university. Right. Like I just got a degree. Um, and so I, after everything that's happened, I'm like, I'm ready to start hitting up some big brands. Like I want to start getting to some commercial stuff after doing two years of focusing on one project. I was ready to focus on a few more than one project. Yeah. So I was like, I'm hitting up the car brands. Like I was so clueless. Cause now looking at the car world, it's such an intimidating world. I was like, fuck it. I go on my little site <laughs> data connect, connect site. And I'm like, yeah, can, you, can you tell the people what the name or the website link is? <laughs> it's data it's dot just, connect. Is this still a site? I think, I don't even know. If How it the still fuck exists. are they pulling my, it's info. gotta be illegal. That's gotta be super illegal. But anyway, so I go on yeah. the site, I'm like Audi, Bentley, boom, 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 boom. All these big brands. I get hit back by Audi and they're like, Hey, we need someone. We're looking to do some content that like, uh, bridges like athletes to our cars and I'm like I'm your man yeah I got this and, but it's all social content but still decent budgets and what were you showing them like did you make a reel at this time or were you just no, sending yeah, I had to a, a website I've always updated my reel my reel has been my bible you just sidebar he just showed me his new reel and this shit is fucking nuts maybe I could is can I play it on, on here I don't see why not for the YouTube part of it play 
and then unplay. <laughs> it's over. You just watched Anyways, it. How amazing was that reel? Amazing. Oh my goodness. It was really nice. Thank you. How long did it take you to edit that? Mm, like four days. Four days? Fuck. But it took me like two months to get in the headspace to find all the footage on my million hard drives spread across my place Worse. to put it together. Yeah. That's the hardest part about making a reel. Fucking Once tennis. you get in the groove and you got the sound and everything, it's mm-hmm. like boom, boom, boom. Um, and like getting other people's thoughts on like, what you, cause you're so married to so many shots that probably actually aren't that good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I always had a reel. I still believe in a reel since I've been in LA. This was my first reel in like two years that I put to get put out now. Right. But it's, um, it's key. I think for like when you're going on a more boutique scale, a uh, lot of brands, when you're dealing direct to brands, they're not going to probably watch through all your commercials. I feel like you catch them with the reel and you've got them sold. Right. In my opinion. Interesting. So anyways, I got Audi mm-hmm. and again, Audi Europe. Oh really? Yeah. And I, uh, went and shot a video with a world cup skier, like a ski racer in Austria, Eric Gay. And, and I did, so four of these videos, I did a skier, a kite surfer, and another skier. And blah, like this blah, is blah. all part of the campaign. Yeah. These four so people. they're like four social pieces. Right. Four, four people, four videos. Yeah. Got it. Like little sixties. And, um, actually on my website, I think one of them still lives on there. It's, really? it's lasted this long. Oh shit. But, um, yeah. So I got to shoot cars. Like, so we did the R8, Audi R8, which was so cool yeah and then i gotta drive that thing on the autobahn is crazy Ooh, i want to ride on there so bad i did the new q7 um, q5 and the rs6 which is like the station wagon mm-hmm. um actually the first shoot was with the rs6 and i thought it'd be f- it was on a snow track yeah i thought it'd be fun to take the car for a rip and so and we had like a stunt driver and stuff and i put it in the bank right away and the bank was actually a concrete like pillar you were driving yeah i was drifting around the corner you were drifting i thought it'd be cool to drift the car around oh the corner oh my god this thing was closed off for us this track like yeah this snow track go around the corner nose right good. in because i knew nothing i didn't know what i was doing and i was just like a <laughs> young idiot put it in and i thought just a snowbank whatever but it's what the one concrete pillar hidden under the snow out of the whole track i hit it and oh ripped the bumper off fuck we had to drive it two hours to the Audi headquarters to oh, go get a new bumper shit. quickly because it's all like carbon or whatever. Like, oh, it's a nightmare. I remember I was I had my tail between my legs for that. Good lesson learned though. Yeah, don't touch don't the cars. Don't fucking touch the cars. Don't touch the cars. Oh my God. As cool as they look, don't touch the cars. But learned that lesson <laughs> and luckily it's like a small like social shoot and they, everyone kind of thought it was funny. And yeah. Luckily I didn't get my head ripped off. For right. It. But um, yeah, so I did those for Audi and then that started my car career Mm. and so then i went audi i think i did bentley next again i hit them up direct i was lucky i got feedback and i always pitched like not big tv commercials i just pitched like content whatever that would end up being and i was successful and like budgets were low for them but they're big for me right and enough where i'm making a decent amount of money on and, these. and are you doing the, this is still bootstrapped one man band style shit or are you no, bringing in a couple people? at this point i'm bringing like you know um a camera assistant um i'm bringing you know we had a producer or like kind of it's not like this is what these are just my friends that i just brought that did jobs and we yeah. just made this happen right but you were dping and editing and yeah. directing everything still yeah, yeah. um it eventually turned into i share dp role with some people like a friend that was learning how to run camera and right. then he became really talented and then we just passed camera off back and forth right. and it became really like organic mm-hmm. um but like i'd say that point is still today some like the most enjoyable types of shoots right. i've ever done um just like you know no clients breathing down your neck like i did a subaru commercial last week and um i had nine clients fly in from new york and it's just like it's hard to be creative when, when you have like these creative agencies and yeah. clients and people breathing down your neck like uh, are we seeing enough of profile of the car in this shot right or, and it's just like and i love it it's a different type of work mm. but it's not the type of work that you end up putting on your reel right in my opinion yeah 
and every just want to say right now disclaimer every director has a different opinion yeah these are all my opinions yeah totally from my past right experience but um so anyways i started doing car brands and i built my car wheel up really quick and with big brands hmm. and and then i started cutting down those uh clips like two minute social pieces or wherever they were into 30 second tv commercials to and i never like said they were tv commercials but i wanted to look like i made tv commercials right and so i was like and then I just started getting work from ad agencies and production companies. And like my, you know, my web grew from there. Mm. My connections grew. And so I started doing just a bunch of like, I, I did some stuff for Louis Vuitton, Hugo Boss. I got into the fashion industry because Bentley like really seamlessly transitioned into that, like the luxury world into the fashion world. Who's, who the fuck is Hugo Boss? They asked, they DM me and asked me to share my footage from tour all the time on their social it's a clothing channels. brand. But it's, it's European or something? Some other... I don't know where they're from. It's a different language. They share my shit on Twitter all the time. <laughs> oh, that's tight. Yeah. You should ask for like a suit. They're expensive. Are they? I think so. I should. Huh. Anyways, I did a little like campaign yeah. <laughs> for them. Um, and so I kind of went car, fashion, a little bit of tourism. But most of your work's overseas? Uh, Are you doing uh, at this, this point? By this time, like all of it's all overseas. All of it is, right? Like mainly in Europe. Yeah. Which is awesome. Like I loved it. Right. Get paid in euros mm. and... It's great. Yeah. Canadian dollar. That's perfect. I was living in Canada, but just traveling lots. Right. But I was never home. Right. And so that's about the point when everything started to flip upside down. But how though? It feels like you were at a good pace. I was at a great pace, but I bought a really expensive house. <laughs> yeah. I had two brand new vehicles. I had a wife mm -hmm. that bless her soul, but likes to shop just like <laughs> myself i like to shop clearly and it's not like I, we were spending so much it put us under but i had a lull mm. so i remember it was the christmas holidays we were living life everything was great traveling i was working a lot like i never stopped pushing but january came around and no jobs came in and also to say at this point i started to sit back a little bit right i was like it sounded like was, before you were very like i was forward approach approaching firing like climbing yeah. and at that point things just started to happen clients came back and it was great that's what you want mm -hmm. but i sat back a little too much and then january rolled around didn't get a job and i'm like ooh. and then you know your monthly payments come out and you're like ooh, fuck i'm a, like that took a big chunk of my bank account really quick right and then February came around, March, April. I went six months without a job. Holy shit. And I I went under. Like right. I, I had no money left and I ended up going into debt on my credit cards to make everything oh, come across. And, fuck. and I remember going to my parents and being like, I need help. Like, I'm screwed. Like this, something's wrong. Right. And I was in such a weird space that I had to like, I needed this mm -hmm. to happen because I was going down a shitty road. Like I had bad habits. And it's not like we're talking drug habits, but like different well, you, habits. You said that, that earlier. You, instead of drugs, you like, instead of drugs, I picked things. Yeah. Materialistic things. Yeah. Like, very materialistic. Mm. Um, and so everything kind of hit a sudden stop. And like, it's not like my parents are wealthy. Like my dad's a teacher but does very well and is very smart with money. And, and he's a dope musician. He's a musician yes. and taught me a lot about music and I get a lot of my creativity, I think from him. Right. And same with my mom, but my mom is like teaches a dance class and is kind of semi retired, but like not retired, but like, you know, right. She's just getting through. Yeah. And, um, well not like getting through, but neither of them are loaded right put it that way. So it was at a point where like, they can't help me. Uh -oh. I'm, I have to like forfeit everything. File I bankruptcy. To, I didn't file bankruptcy, but I was in the position with the house where I could just like step away, like get out of it, sold it really quick. It was easy. Cause it was like a, it was um, a private mortgage with mm. someone. So, just because of the scenario that happened, but it ended up being great. I was right. able to walk away without like any crazy. It was only like a, whatever, a little bit of a penalty. Yeah. Um, I had to break all my leases with my cars. 
Which are not cheap. Which my parents helped me out with that actually a bit. Yeah. Um, because that wasn't cheap. Like I could do one of them and the other one I needed a little bit of money. Fuck. And do you know what? I was vulnerable and I was like, it was, it sucked, but it felt great to feel all the weight lifted off my shoulders mm. and be able to be like, I'm ready to go again and I'm going to do this right. Right. Like I'm not tied down and I'm not having to take jobs for a certain reason now. Right. So. Yeah, it's true. Cause then eventually you're just taking your, you got to pay the, you got to pay the fee. You yeah. know what I mean? So we, uh, me and my wife ended up buying a smaller house. Cause again, I live in Canada in a small town. You can buy homes. It's real estate's cheap. So we yeah. bought a little house and some acreage and, um, out of town and it was really affordable and we could afford it. And, and we got married and this is like, that's when we got married. And I'm just, I was thinking like, babe, I need to do something different. Like I, I kind of lost the like drive to like cold call things. I don't know if I felt like I was too good to be cold calling people, which obviously wasn't the case, but I just wasn't on the same like track. Yeah. Right. I was like waiting for people to just give me work. Hmm. And I was like, and at this point too, I was like, I don't want to be doing commercials forever. I want to grow into something bigger. I want to do feature films. Mm -hmm. Like I want to do what I've, I think I've always wanted to do. And now I need to do it. Right. And I'll regret if I don't ever take a stab at it. Yeah. And so we're like, let's move to Los Angeles. Like I want to kick this can or else I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. Yeah, totally. And we could. So we kept our house, but my parents moved, my mom and her husband were looking to move out of their place. Right. And they're like, yeah we'll move into your place like and they kind of like took that place over and we kept our dog with them because he loved he was a hunting dog he loved running around on the property right and we i applied for my visa it took eight months to get my work visa to come to the states jesus and cost a lot of money which you know i was we were just running tight at that point because i was finally getting a bit of work here and there again but so you can buy you buy your work visa if you're not working for a company in the states is that kind of how that works you just to get your visa so i have an o1 it's an artist visa okay three years and it costs about ten thousand canadian mm. just for the visa maybe a bit under somewhere around there um and then lawyer fees i had a lot of lawyer fees because it took so long for me to do it right and then my management company, Magnolia, sponsored me to come in. Oh, okay. And, so it's like uh, a combination of the sponsor plus you have to have the work visa to be able to be here? No, they they host my visa. Got it. Okay, cool. So, but I pay for everything, but right. they just sign papers and like vouch me. Yeah, yeah. Which was amazing. Like I had mm -hmm. a friend that really hooked me up with that. And that's how I met Sandler. Right. But um, so yeah, we moved to the States. We moved to Venice and I... Uh, it opened a whole new world for me. And now a year and a half later, we're moving back and I've learned more in the last year and a half about what I want to do as a director and how I'm going to move forward mm -hmm. than I could have been back in Nelson. Right. So moving to LA, was that difficult coming here because most of your time you've only ever worked overseas or in Canada? You've never worked in America really yeah. that often. It was actually a pretty seamless transition for me because I came here and I was still working in Europe a bit. Mm -hmm. Like you've known this. Yeah, yeah, you I go back and forth. go there quite a bit. But I got that like hunger back again because now I was going after like a feature drive. Like I'm like, I'm going for a different kind of fish. Right. And so I just started like networking and meeting everyone I could. And I started with my bubble at IMAX that I knew and I grew from there. Right. And I just grew out and it ended up growing into the commercial world. So mm. I signed with a company called Stepped, yep. um, which is in Manhattan Beach there. and Step Studios. Step Studios. And I've done a lot of commercial and doc work with them this year. And then I've also just been getting my own work here and there. And I did a, you know, a really big Ford campaign, which was like, like a, a fucking huge Ford campaign, which was a huge break for me. Yeah. Um, and my first commercial job where I had a day rate that was like, people no. would be angry if they knew what I like, yeah. heard it. Like it's a totally different world. How did that come? From, how did you go about the Ford a one? Production company just hit me up. was like, Hey, we Not could Seth. use your, no, a different one. Yeah. They're called a common thread. They're like, Hey, we could use your reel. Um, and I was like, go for it. 
And they're like, hey, we got you the op- shortlisted on a Ford. And I did all these phone calls and blah, blah, blah. And it was a like, big process because it was such a big campaign. But right. I won it because it was mixed with extreme sports. Mm. And I, uh, and it was insane. Like that was like, and it's not like my, it's probably my least favorite piece of work I've ever done. But the experience of like having like a huge crew like that, like big crew, right? Like, like we are up to sixty people someday. And at, some, at one point, you had a second crew. Then you have someone. Then you yeah, tell me tons of cameras, B, and a B roll team that's going out shooting a bunch of B roll and all yeah, kinds we of had two units at some point, but it, we mainly kept it all together mm. quite a bit, quite often. But you know, we're in the desert with like we had a semi full of trucks and spare trucks and blah 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 following us around everywhere. Like a whole team that was just dedicated to the cars. A semi. Sam, semi. <laughs> I was like, what was he talking about? Yeah, Canadian. Semi truck. Um, Simis. And then, like, yeah, it's it just it was nuts. Why like, did you say that it was your least favorite piece? Just the outcome to- of it. Like, because I don't write it. Like, the, I yeah. write the details and everything, but the creative is given to me. So, and, like, at that level of commercials, it's almost like in, unless they're coming to you to start from scratch and pitch a whole idea. Which you're, usually isn't the case. No, you're fulfilling their whoever fucking agency they probably hired to come up with this idea to shoot and make sure the 30 second spots delivered and the 60 second spots fulfilled. Yeah, you all make these the shit. agency look good. Yeah, you gotta make them look great. So that was crazy because again, tons of clients on set mm-hmm. and really breathing down my neck on that one for like nine days in the desert. How'd you deal with that? I thrive off that. I figured out on that job is my first big agency job with clients and stuff. And I was shitting my pants up until the process, like yeah. until, until we started shooting and I met them. But I loved the, the constant like battle of like keeping them happy and getting the shot. Right. Like, because I knew the creative was set and there's like only so much I could do at that point. Like that relationship also really gave me like a rush. Right. Like I need these people to love me mm-hmm. and they did. Yeah. And it was like a super fun, successful shoot. But inside the whole time I'm like tense, like crazy, just like trying to keep them happy. Right. How the and, fuck did I get to this spot? <laughs> well, and that too, I, again, still like faking it till I make it. Yeah. Like I, learned so much on that shoot because I had to act like I've done 10 of them. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We, I think we did two morning roasts that are on that similar thing where it's, I think the one that comes out before this at some point, either this weekend, uh, but what time we're recording this at. So people understand we're recording this in the past. It is now the future when you're listening to it. But at some point we're putting out a, a morning roast to say yes. So you can say no. And there's another one that's like being a one man band and how that can fuck you up a little bit and being able to like kind of spread your wing and be able to delegate, but then also use that to parlay jobs. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the idea of being able to say, if you do this one for a commercial and if you try to, if for some reason they let you do it by yourself and you try to do everything on your own, you'll just exhaust yourself and you won't be able to do it. Whereas if you delegate and utilize a 60 man team and have access to all this incredible talent and that's where you spread your budget out to, you're now able to focus on what you're really there to do. Make sure you do that really well. And the time that you would have stressed trying to do all these other things, this is more relatable for like smaller budget jobs, but the more you're doing which all these, we all do. which we all do. But I think at the, there's a certain point where we do need to delegate. And if we do delegate, then we can do what we're good at. And you happen to be really good at selling. Like you're good at selling, right? So if yeah. you could spend more time selling, less time having to do the web design for the layout of, for some reason they asked you mm. to do that too, you would be better off out there selling while some other kid or someone's doing the web design. And you yeah. can just pay them to do that. So, so to kind of continue on from that, it's like, the I went being in LA I learned like a lot from Andrew Sandler too Mm -hmm. and like other people like how a real production runs in LA which is you know some people say a bit more of an old school mentality but it's more like the bigger scale mentality it's like when you need to permit and you need to do all these things like this is how it gets done and this is how it's supposed to be done and like there's a lot of things you can take from that to bring into a smaller scale benefit a smaller scale production totally and so i learned how to work with a dp Mm -hmm. for the first time i learned how to work with writers for the first time i learned how to work with editors for the first time like real editors that you're like wow you're 
fucking amazing mm-hmm. colorists color sessions mixing sessions blah, blah, all this stuff yeah and so i i went to that school right while i've been here but at the same time since i've been here i've really i came here to be really hungry but i ended up coming here and just chasing paychecks hmm. because my rent i was living us we came here to not spend money we bought a piece of shit car that i just drove you home from the restaurant in shout out to you yeah and so you know like i didn't spend money on a car here it's the first time i've never had a brand new vehicle in a long gave, time i gave you a three-star rating yeah okay sorry and then you know we st- we're in a 400 square foot uh studio apartment right. which it's in a nice ha- neighborhood but my wife doesn't work and we need to be somewhere safe so right. it was a you know a bit of a compromise but again rent is not cheap in la you know the food here everything costs so much money like we're still living bare bones and or like bare bones compared to yeah, and like need, what yeah. we can do to function and right. and i'm having to chase paychecks just to make it mm-hmm. and so luckily being here i've been really successful i signed with some nice people i've built a lot of great relationships and the work's been coming in and it's been great right and i've learned a lot but now you know having a kid coming on the way and us moving back to canada and just looking where my career is now compared to where it was when we moved here i've realized so much that like there's so much fluff in this career and so many things to like focus on and dire directions to go but for me the route and like what i need to focus on moving forward is making noise mm creating content creating stuff that makes an image for yourself that grabs people's attention the way the world works now with commercial branded content everything the way contents digested Mm -hmm. films are digested i like i've been here being on big sets and i see my homies back in nelson that are working in production companies and they're winning huge festivals like cans and stuff with just passion projects. Right. And the stuff I'm doing here, I'm never going to get the opportunity ever. And you don't have time. There's and no I don't have time because I'm on set with clients shooting a Subaru commercial with dogs and dog treats. Like, not that I say I don't like that stuff, but I'm I'm going on the feature road now. Like, right. I want to do, um, like, I just got my first proof of concept for a feature funded. We're shooting in Rwanda next month. And... You know, I'm, I actually just won a series, like a scripted series. So, like, I'm going down that road. Right. But nothing really has come out of L.A. And I'm not saying that L.A. is not the place to be, but it's not the place for me. Right. Like, it's not... I need low overhead mm. so that I can create passion projects and get my momentum going again. Because that's what I had when I started. It was momentum. Again, it was, like, because I was hunting brands, but... I was creating work that I wanted to create, that I was writing, that like just felt good to me. Right. And now I need to do this, but on a bigger scale. Mm-hmm. Not to say that, like I'm, you know, my reel's getting better, mm-hmm. where I can now compete for bigger jobs. But I still need to shoot spec commercials. Right. And so a spec for people that don't know is like a fake commercial that you pay for yourself or your production company pays for you. Um, depends what level you're at but like it's really the base of like always be creating yeah like no matter what momentum is key well and you can do that so much more with less overhead like the idea of you just talking about passion projects if you actually have an idea that you think you'd be passionate about creating for coca-cola and you could go shoot a little thing over the weekend that involves your idea and all it takes is a little bit of money to travel to tulum or something and you can come back and say look like this is the type of content i want to create for you guys imagine what it would be like with a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars so like i'm starting to do like scripted content for brands Mm -hmm. to help bridge that gap between like what i want to do and puts practice right but there's like an art to it too because i first got this idea like you know a few months ago or whatever and I was like, I'm going to go shoot a bunch of specs. I have my own camera gear, blah, blah, blah. I can just do it. And I just shot like a bunch of specs. And, but they're shit because I just rushed it and I just, just doing it to turn them over right. to build my reel when that's not the case. Mm. Like now I'm looking at like, okay, hey, I want to write this spec for this concept I have. That's just like story driven. Like it's all story driven for me right now. And it's a good I idea. need to do it right. Yeah. I need to like make sure that every shot I take 
I put as much effort into it as if I had the clients breathing down right. my neck. Like I, it's, it's got to be perfect. So I'd rather spend a year shooting one spec and that'll benefit me more than, you know, spending a day doing one. Yeah, totally. And so that's something huge that I'm learning right now. It's like, it doesn't really matter where you are, right? where you live, who you are, what camera you have. Like I've seen specs that blow my mind that were shot on a Canon 5D Mark II. And yeah. I'm like, why did I spend so much money in a red? Mm -hmm. But beside the point, it doesn't matter any of that stuff. It's just all about creating. If you can create noise, you're going to move forward because you're creating momentum for yourself. And so right now, like me going home, you know, a lot of people would look at me in my career and be like, man, like, I, I just want to be there. I just want to be shooting like car commercials and get the chance to do that. And like, yeah, of course I feel blessed. Like I have these opportunities, but they've also shown me like I can do so much more and get so much further with just investing in myself right? rather than spending the money I just made on a car commercial and putting it into like, you know, a car, another car or whatever, yeah. or getting a nicer place. Like I'm going home to live in a place that costs half the amount that I'm living in here. Yeah. And I'm putting every dollar I make a into my kid and my family, of course, but also into myself. Like, I, I'm going to, even at the level I'm at, which I'm not at the top, not even close, not even a halfway, but I'm at a decent enough place where I probably don't need to be doing sp that many specs right now, but I'm going to control my own future. Mm -hmm. I'm going to control my own path and where I go, like I did when I started, but now to a bigger scale, to the bigger picture. And so as soon as I get back, I'm shooting specs. Right, that's dope. And it's it's cool because you guys will get to go home. I mean, imagine having a baby in Venice Beach. Well, you have like a lot of bums to babysit for you, I guess. They're all nice down there. Jesus Christ. No, but it's you'll just get not to, my scene. You know, but you'll get to go home and have the help of your family and shit and Chelsea's family or whatever to do that. And at the same I time. I travel so much too. We need it. Yeah, that'll be good. So then do you plan on, what's the plan then? Because before you were talking about coming back to California at some point, but are you guys thinking like, you just want to see what happens from being able to sit there and sit back a little bit and, and invest. I think about that all the time. Like so, if I could go home to Iowa and start focusing on this shit, like what would I be able to do? So basically my, the way I see it is, um, we're going to go back, have the kid there cause healthcare is free. Right. Oh yeah. And shit. I'm going to just, sense. I'm just going to create. Yeah. Like I'm just going to create. Mm -hmm. And I have like 10 things I want to create. I'll probably get three of them done. Um, I'm working, shooting my proof of concept. I'll be working on that. Mm -hmm. But, um, I basically, by the time summer comes around, like you still need to sell projects and it definitely helps being in a city to network and sell and meet the right people. But another big thing I've learned since I've been here is I've been in a lot of crazy meetings with like crazy producers, studios, blah, blah, blah. And like, I'm sitting there like stabbing myself in the leg being like, why don't I have something to show them that's worth their time here? Like, you can talk all you want. You can meet all you want. But if you don't have a project to sell or something to show them that kind of blows their socks off, mm -hmm. you're just like every other person in the city, which is a lot of people. Yeah, fuck time. So I need to go home and make noise. Right. I need to ha be able to go into these meetings and people be like, wow, that's amazing. Or that's the like, idea is unreal. Why didn't we meet you before? Oh. Or like, but like, I'm just, I've been working on just fitting in and like, getting my reel to where all these other directors reels are that I idolize, which is a great first step, but that's not how you make noise. Right. That's not how you get above and like above and beyond. Mm. So I'm like focusing on going home and like creating content that I'm so stoked on, so proud of, put all my energy in. I'm not getting paid for it. It's costing me money, mm. but in the long run, it's so worth it. Yeah. It's going to pay off tenfold. Damn. So that's my goal goal and i'll let you know if it works out <laughs> thanks dude really appreciate it fuck it's a crazy story yeah it's kind of gone full circle it's pretty nuts but no i'll probably end up going home buying a new truck in another house. no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> that is not do you want even um, close to do you want possible. a free a free um tip you don't have to pay me for it maybe for one of your specs you could shoot a baby commercial can i tell you something you already had it written down? 
I was like, I'm going to shoot. I want to shoot this spec because I know my kid's going to be cute as fuck. Right. Probably. I want to shoot my spec. Takes after your mom. Nah. Yeah. No, I'm actually going to probably use my brother's kid they just had because <laughs> I want to shoot this right away. Right. But I have this idea of like this kid walking towards this stroller because we've been stroller shopping lately, yeah. which is a money pit. Right. Like, oh my God. Talk about cars. You could go nuts with strollers. Yeah, but for real. Not my thing. Kid walking slow motion, like holding a mom's hand towards its stroller, but then intercut with the kid in a space suit watch, walking towards like a rocket. And it's like, you know, three, two, ready for day. The kid's getting buckled in and then cut with him buckling into his seat, looking up at the stars. Maybe dumb. It's a dope idea. Yeah, and it's like adventure takes you anywhere. You should do it as a Formula One car instead of a rocket. No, but you, you, no, but you can have the rocket. You know the beds that are rockets. No, I've never been in a spaceship. No, like the beds, like the toy beds, like bunk beds oh, that are right. rocket ships. Yeah, you can. I was thinking of using like one of that. those, right. like playing off that a bit. That'd so it's dope. like dreamy kid, like not like an actual rocket. I was just thinking if it was um the push carts or whatever, then you have the kids sit in the thing, and then all of a sudden he's feeling like he's flying through like just a like, fucking formula one <laughs> but really yeah. he's just like walking and the mom's like grabbing cereal or something. yeah <laughs> that's fucking tight you should make like 10 spec kids or kids spec commercials um, i'm thinking of a diaper one like i just saw a diaper commercial with um uh john legend okay uh, yeah was he wearing a diaper he's you know he has his kid right <laughs> yeah he's singing to his kid for a pampers commercial i'm like genius Dang, like I should get into the kid market. Yo, you need to make commercials. We should talk about this shit off of, uh, off the podcast. But the last <laughs> one I'll say is, you should do, uh, you should target fucking Amazon, bro, and create ads that they can play that would push to Amazon. Because no one's probably thinking like that. They're thinking that mm. they need to do Pampers, and but they just the idea of pushing pushing consumers that all these moms that are on IG straight to Amazon to buy their fucking toilet paper shit. No, but see, this is where I'm gonna get sidetracked. I got to keep on my goal, like right. narrative. Right. So anything I create, even if it's short form, it's got to be very story driven because that's like my passion. That's what I yeah. want to do. That's what I want to practice it and mm-hmm. be good at. So again, the side, the kid idea, maybe that's not so much like narrative driven, but yeah, don't worry about it. I got to use my kid at one. something. Yeah. I'll, I'll start putting, I'll direct that one. But I've got some other ideas and I, I'm stoked to just, um, I asked, stuff to do. I let black with no cream in them. I'll ask you questions. So I'm going to ask you those right now. If okay. you don't, if you don't, do you have more time for us? Can yeah, we? I got time. Thank you, dude. Appreciate it. I'm um, only packing tomorrow and leaving the next day for Canada, but it's okay. I got time for you. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to pull that all off. And it's 400 square feet. It's pretty quick to true, pack up. Very bro. true. That's like this room. Um, let's see. So I asked them to ask you some stuff. I know you peeped it real quick before we started. I did. Of course, my internet's being trash on my phone and not letting me pull it up. Here it is. Okay, cool. Got some good questions. Um, Sean Sa says, have you ever gotten hurt on set or wrist injury or seen someone that uh, you film get hurt with like the action sports stuff? All of the above. I got hurt on set once. So when I was in my peak of my action sports stuff for yeah. that universal film, I loved cable cams. And like the cable cam where you go in a harness and you're on the cable cam. Oh, cool. So I bought an 800 foot cable cam <laughs> and like built it myself. Like I made it, but I bought the steel cable. And that blah, you blah, could ride on? That I rode on. Jesus. With the red. And I remember hiring, my, like bringing one of my homies on set and we were shooting mountain biking. And I was like, okay, hey, you're the braking system. Like, cause again, I built this. So I, it was pretty Jimmy rigged, but he had this like rope safety rope and he was my break. Yeah. He was a big dude. Yeah. But I, remember, I don't know if he's on Instagram or what he was on, like something on his phone or whatever. And, um, I hit that tree going so fast, <laughs> so hard, smashed the screen on my red, oh, bent the fuck. lens like as a Canon 70 to 200. And it was like a little uh, corked out, but I remember I hit the tree and then swung over top of the cable. Oh like, my God. Yeah. I was pretty, I, I, I think I don't think I broke ribs, but I really was hurting after that. But so that's me getting hurt. But that's about the only time. Um, and then shooting with Red Bull, I had a guy break his back, and he actually was paralyzed in Italy. Oh shit! In the mountains. He got heli vacked out. We're actually um, homies, but I have a. Can I tell a quick, really funny story with that? Be my guest. Okay, so. I love how it just went from my homie broke his back to let me tell you a quick funny story. He would love to hear them telling the story right now. Okay. He's in great spirits. Right. And I think he actually got a lot of half his body mobility back. But, yeah. Um, so we shot that day and he hit his, 
hit this like stump and he got heli backed out but his helmet and bike were still there and his gopro was on his helmet so i take his bike and i take his helmet and we take it down for him in the gondola and um i remember getting it was like a few days later i'm in the bus and i'm like going through footage and i dump his gopro card and um his girlfriend was with him on this trip and so all i see is like a frame of a bed and i'm just like what and i got my other homie beside me who's a rider and he's like dude we have to watch this i knew he did that stuff and i'm like no 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 no. and so i like get off the laptop and they start going through it and he had like these there's tons of sex tapes on his gopro <laughs> and so i remember the first time we went and visited him in the hospital we brought the like we made a little sex tape at it uh, not, uh, my buddy who's really in, like he's pretty weird but he made my a little buddy's sex pretty tape. into those weird sex yeah. tape things man he, he added to this funny sex oh tape my to it. God. And just like it was, it was great because it made him smile yeah, yeah he was like, probably dying fuck yeah um let's see gene paul dia says um How does your story align with your client's demographic? Are you selling feelings or visuals more than one one over the other? Or, and also what's the lowest budget you've had to produce and shoot a a video for? So when I pitch, like now I pitch very story heavy Mm -hmm. first because visuals are visuals. Now it's so competitive. I feel like, like you watch like Kendrick Lamar's music videos and like the stuff that's coming out black with no cream and like, yeah, it's hard to compete with that stuff. Right. Like visuals are crazy. People are so gifted that mm. I feel like if you're pitching one certain really crazy visual, it's always great to help amplify the story. But for me, like my strong point right now is story, right? Like, story first. So I try to do that with brands and like try to sell them on like why the story is so important and how the visuals complement the story. But when I first started, I was pitching just visuals. Right. Like I was like I had my reel, and that's what all what it all was about. So it's kind of turned one eighty there. Mm. But um, but yeah, that's where I'm at now. And then what's the second part? Of the- what's the lowest budget uh, you've lowest had a budget. producer or shoot a commercial for? Well, nothing. Like free, free. Like Red Bull, I did free. Right. Like I, we made a whole film. Yeah. For free. Um. But that wasn't like the film budget. The lowest budget. Uh, cause obviously the film had to pay for a lot of stuff, but mm-hmm. I made no money, but the right. lowest gross budget was, um, a thousand dollar music video. Yeah. Yeah. When was that? In LA? No, it was, um, some Canadian rap, Vancouver, some good old Canadian, Canadian rap, electronic, or they called young poutine. No. <laughs> no, I love my jokes. I can't even remember the name of the young band, poutine, but it was, um, it was really cool. That was actually a really fun music video. Yeah, low budgets are, can be. It was just friends, exciting. and they were acting in it, and like we just did this like love relationship of this, like um, couple breaking up, and they got a fight, and then it's cool. Tight. Um, Garen Weeks asked a question about um, approaching clients, but we already talked that talked about that. Eric Brolin, Bro- Brolin, I think, says, "What is the most epic rig setup that you've uh, used when filming a car commercial?" I'd probably say Ford was like the most legit rig. how did you do the spin was that um the so the, it's a russian arm yeah so it's called filmatech okay um shout out those guys are sick but it's basically a porsche cayenne suv with a huge crate yeah. on the top and a gyro it was a gyro and so it's like a it's like a movi like a gimbal basically on it but like heavy duty and so you're inside and you got this like joystick like in the a, car in the car with a tv screen and then there's a crane operator in the back that does the tilt yeah and then there's a driver and then um focus puller and one other person oh the tech Mm. like the guy who just makes sure everything's running good but i'm sitting there with like these two joysticks uh, controlling the camera it's the funnest shit you'll ever do in your life it's like video game and i get really car sick but luckily i didn't at all doing this because we did this for like 10 days how are you communicating with the, the guy that's he's running right the- beside you he's laying in the trunk oh and he's lifting up and down the, the jib the crane but he's got like a little seat a compact seat so it's cool. legit like this these things are like kitted out they have like ford f1 or ford um raptors with the crane on them but uh, we chose this one because we're on pavement and needs right. to go fast but it's so fun you're like left hard right up and then before we shoot we have like um uh, one of those toy road map carpets for kids. I don't know. So like toy cars. Yeah. So I had a 
fire truck with the arm that was the crane that was oh, spray painted black that's hilarious and put a little lego camera on it and then like a car and then you have these rugs that have roads so we bought one of those and then that's where we practice our maneuvers and then we went and did it that's crazy but it's like oh my god it's so much fun i could do that every day yeah that should be a fucking that tight. and shooting in water every day so fun i wish fuck um let's see last question let's see let's pick one um actually that's this is kind of uh similar similar question that we've already talked about yeah we've already covered all this stuff those are good questions i asked it literally like an hour before we did this interview so Perfect. i don't think very many people got to ask questions but if you're listening right now and want to ask questions on any podcast become a patreon member <laughs> and get instant access to ask people like mike questions because you never know hopefully we give good answers that last one was pretty tight the the car thing on the rug that's pretty a good i don't know if you need to go to the extreme of painting this motherfucker no no that. you buy them they're like pre-made what they got roads they're rugs with i'm roads talking about them. the how you guys spray painted your little fire truck oh, yeah, it's just it's matte you black. just needed to be matte black just for do you guys understand what this no, is but the porsche this is matte the black like i know but fucking use your imagination you guys are shooting creative content hey when you have a budget that big paint the bloody you car buy the lego black. camera <laughs> buy the lego camera uh this is a good interview dude thank Thanks, you bro. well hopefully i didn't blabber too much no I you didn't this was a good story i'm i'm glad that uh that you're gonna go home and fucking get creative i wish i want to do that so many times there's so many times in my head where i'm like i want to go back to iowa and just create well i'll either be back before you know it or yeah you'll be coming down to hang out with me i'm definitely coming up to hang out with you oh yeah for fucking sure that place looks amazing um if anyone if you guys got this far in the podcast i always um give you the opportunity to create a hashtag so that if people made it this far i want them to go to your instagram i'll leave the his instagram handle in the show notes but go to your ig tag me in it and leave this hashtag and you get to pick it so that we both know me yeah i want them to go to your instagram and on the last post no, no matter what time whatever time it is right now when you're listening to this whatever the last post on his instagram is go there and comment on his post tag my shit and then put this hashtag so oh, me put and Mike, me on the spot yeah i always do this so that me and Mike both know that you made it. It can be whatever hashtag you want, bro. Does it have to be an existing one? No, it can be like, I, I like to fart. It could be like anything you want. Lauren's lashes. It could be whatever you want. Okay. Hashtag make noise. That's perfect. Um, Anything else you want to let I'm leave with I these people? Is there anything else you want to leave? Don't do what I did. <laughs> 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 I don't know, man. It sounds like a pretty dope pad. I don't do some of the things I did. <laughs> I definitely think cold calling. Yeah, that's is, crazy, huh? It, a lot of people it doesn't work for them, but man, it worked for me good. Like mm. I was super fortunate. You hit the right person at the right time. Data dot connect dot com. I don't know if it still runs, <laughs> yeah. but if it does, get a membership. Yeah, that thing is crazy. Fuck, that is ridiculous. Seems super illegal. I hope yeah. I'm not on that shit. Yeah. All Just right, make cool. a fake name. Um, how do you want to end it? Peace out. Peace out. Bye. Ba 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 ba. That's it for episode 59 with Mike Parento. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Make sure to follow Mike on his Instagram, Mike at Mike Parento. Um, Links are all in the show notes, so definitely check that out. Make sure to leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening to, if it's YouTube or whatever, iTunes, etc. Make sure to do that. That helps us out a lot, and it helps other people find out what this podcast is about, and hopefully it helps them. Any feedback is appreciated. Merch is available. Make sure to go to bwnc.com slash merch or shop bwnc.com to pick up some gear and rep the team. Big shout out to all the homies who are supporting us on Patreon. Not only are these guys and girls getting their access to the podcast one week earlier than all of you, they're getting discounts off their merch store. If you want to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash black no cream. And a special shout out to our OU Rich producers of the show, Aisha and Reed. And shout out to our OU Rich Rich executive producers of the show, Craig and Christopher. Y'all are live forever. Subscribe to Black with No Cream on the platform of your choosing. New episodes every single Wednesday and Sunday. See you next week, you bitch.